creativity and online learning so we've got um quite a big range of topics that we want to talk to you about today um and we will be doing a double act we think we're rehearsed yeah so we will hand over seamlessly to each other so this is actually the talk is based on a chapter that we had uh, published recently which we'll talk about in a moment but before we get into doing that, just to give us give you an idea of what we've been involved in recently. My background before working in libraries, I was before at the University of Kent at the British Library and before that in, in music copyright. Um, and you would you, you've been involved in libraries for all your career, haven't you? Yeah, most of my career I've worked in um, online learning and uh, libraries and the kind of area where they overlap, which copyright is very important. Um, I worked at the London School of Economics for 15 years before I became a lecturer at City. And um, I actually teach and I, I'm the uh, programme director of a master's in academic practice. So it's not for uh, library uh, students. It's actually for our lecturers. But some of the modules that we'll talk, I'll talk about later, one of the modules particularly is actually an elective module for um, our library science students at City University. So we talk about copyright literacy. Um, and we run the website copyrightliteracy.org. So if you go to this website, you'll see all of our resources, all of the publications that we've done, guest posts from uh, people that have written for us, um, and everything that we talk about, we share as openly as possible. Uh, we are open practitioners, so you'll find that on the website and one of those uh, resources or that area of resources that are, are available there are some of the games that we've created around copyright so jane and i take playful approaches to copyright sometimes some people think copyright can be a bit boring <laughs> or a bit um, annoying or a bit difficult whereas we like to create an environment where we can have some fun uh, play some games and get the most out of people talking to each other. So we started with a game called Copyright the Card Game. So it's a card game based around copyright law in the UK, but it has been uh, adapted for other countries. Uh, uh, and we're looking to see how we can get this adapted um, to other countries across Europe. Yes, we have a, a team who are working um, in um, Finland. Yes. And we also have a team in Spain that mm -hmm. are working on an adaptation of, of both of our games, Yes, actually. So, so the other game is? So, yeah, the other game is called The Publishing Trap. Um, and this game um, ha is not based on UK law. It's a game related to scholarly communication and open access. And it's aimed at early career researchers. So it's used quite a lot in universities around the world um, to teach researchers how, uh, how copyright and licensing and open access works, particularly um, when they are a, um, you know, going through their career as a, a, an academic. So it's based on some characters and it's a role play game and it's lots of fun. And we adapted it during the pandemic so it can be played online on Teams or Zoom using breakout rooms, as we did with our other game as well. Yeah. So I've just joined the chat, uh, the, the meeting, so I will start to paste links to some of these in the chat. Um, if we have chat, I don't, actually, don't actually think there is don't. any chat. No, no, okay. We will share all the slides afterwards. You will, yeah, get so the... people can follow the links because yeah. they're all on the slides. So, the other um, main um, way that we um, look at playful approaches to copyright, we've been facilitating a conference for a few years. Um, so, we ha have created a conference that's called Ice Pops, and this conference. Um, is uh, the International Copyright Literacy Event with Playful Opportunities for Practitioners and Scholars. So what we've discovered is that there is actually quite a number of other people around the world um, who are interested in teaching about copyright, but also making it fun and engaging. So they have come along to our conference, shared their ideas, um, and uh, we were really fortunate to have that conference just a couple of weeks ago at the University of Oxford. So there we are 
um, at, at Chris and I on the left um, uh, at the conference in the conference venue. Um, this wasn't the conference venue. This is where we were staying, which is one of the Oxford colleges um, on the morning of the conference. And because we like to have fun with copyright, we had our two little uh, puppet friends who joined us at the conference for the first time and introduced us, didn't they? They did. So, yes. But what we've made available are uh, the presentations from um, all our speakers at the conference. And there's a series of photos if you want to find out more about that. Um, probably worth mentioning now, I think Chris is just going to... Uh, Cue up the music. Yeah. We have a podcast and our podcast is called Copyright Waffle, where we talk to people who are copyright experts or who's, who know something about copyright, have an interesting story to tell. So I'm going to play you the theme tune. It's only very short, but here we go. So there we go. The uh, clue is in the lyrics. It's not legal advice, but it will have to suffice. Um, and we have a lot of fun talking to people. And the most recent one, which is what this picture you can see there on the right, is a conversation we had with Mark Lewison, who is an expert on the Beatles. In fact, the number one expert on the Beatles. I'm a huge Beatles fan. And we talked about how they first came across copyright about music publishing and about uh, parodies and about copyright infringement cases. And we and talked for so long, there are two podcasts. There are two. And the second one is about his archive and about his interactions with libraries as a historian and as a researcher and how copyright can sometimes present barriers. So that's the most exciting one that we've done so far. We do have some others uh, that we have yet to edit so that there are more coming soon. Absolutely. Um, so that's that's all very good. Yeah. So that's a little bit about us and some of the work that we've done. Um, and um, as Chris mentioned, we um, are basing our talk today um, on a chapter that has literally just come out in the last few weeks. Um, so this is a part of a book that IFLA have published that's called Navigating Copyright for Libraries. Um, the chapter that we wrote, um, chapter 13, is Copyright Education and Information Literacy. Um, and this book is an open access book, so um, you can you can buy a print version of this book if you want to. Um, but if you go to the, the DOI that we've given you there, you can actually get access to the full PDF book um, for free. So IFLA have worked really hard to make this available um, uh, in, in open access format. And we're really pleased. I'm just in the process of making sure our chapter is available also in our institutional repository so that um, people can, can get access to that through our publications list as well. So we're gonna base what we say um, broadly speaking on what we talk about in the chapter, but if you are interested, we would recommend that you um, have a look at the book in general and have a read of our chapter. So all the further reading and the references will be in much more detail in the chapter. So I guess really where we want to just start is how this all came about, our interest in what Chris and I call copyright literacy and also what, as you'll see in a moment, the wider community are starting to see um, as an accepted term as well. So um, around um, 2014, um, I was attending the European Conference of Information Literacy and I attended a presentation uh, by three of the people who are in this photo with me um, from um, uh, various European countries. Um, so we have Tanya Todorova, who is the lead um, uh, uh, sort of instigator of this project, who's from Bulgaria. Um, we have uh, Jumana, who's from France. We have Serap from uh, Turkey. And then we had another colleague um, who uh, is from uh, Croatia. And they collaborated on looking at how much librarians uh, in their countries knew about copyright. They called this a copyright literacy uh, survey, and they were presenting some findings of this. 
And at that time um, in 2014, they were asking for other European countries to come forward if they wanted to run the survey in their own country. Um, and I approached them and Chris and I ran the survey in the UK. Um, and what resulted a few years later was this publication which is uh, the results of a multinational study now covering 14 countries, um, mainly in Europe, but there are a couple of other countries from around the world that um, participated. I think Mexico and the USA as well were part of this. Um, but it's um, enabled comparisons to be drawn between the levels of understanding about copyright um, in different countries and um, how it was seen by information professionals, by librarians and by people working in the cultural heritage sector. So we became very, very interested in this topic um, and it sort of has led us down a path that we've continued to work in to, to understand why it is that copyright can be such a challenging um, and but potentially very important area for those of us uh, working in the library and information field and in obviously very closely associated fields in cultural heritage, in education more broadly. So one of the first things we did was we looked at what is this term? What does it mean? Yeah, so we we were working with that project. And I think at that time there was perhaps there was a, an assumption that everyone knew what copyright literacy meant. And then subsequently, Jane and I came up with the definition that it's about acquiring and demonstrating the appropriate knowledge, skills and behaviours to enable the ethical creation and use of copyright material. And what what that means is it's not simply about learning facts about copyright law mm. it's about seeing how it works in context and helping communities to work out not just what information they need but what kind of behaviors they want to see and how they can interact with copyright law in order to create uh, new insights new creative expressions um, and make use of material that already exists so what we're going to do very quickly is go through my what copyright is in a nutshell. Yeah, um, that's the term we use here. Uh, so very quickly, number one, copyright is a type of intellectual property right that protects certain types of creative expressions. We call the works literary, artistic, musical, dramatic, typographical, sound recordings, films and broadcasts. Um, and if it's sufficiently original, then copyright automatically exists whenever something is fixed in some kind of form, such as writing or recording. So there are uh, certain activities which we call in our game usages. So all of these icons come from our card game, copying, distributing copies to the public, public performance, communication to the public, rental or lending, adaptation um, or any of the above with an adaptation. So these are the things that in order for you to do those with a copyright work, you have to ensure that your usage is legal. Now, the first way that you can use those works legally is under a license. So it is illegal use with permission. So there are organisations, rights holders, collective bodies, individuals that own rights or have control of copyright, and they can provide permission for specific uses. Um, and that's for electronic library resources or consumer streaming services. Um, uh, all of these things come with licenses associated with them. But the thing that's really important in, in library world is to be aware of legal uses without permission. So our copyright exceptions, things such as quotation or for teaching or for recording broadcasts. And there are a range of them. We, we have icons created from those that are in the United Kingdom's uh, uh, copyright legislation, uh, but they actually exist across all countries around the world. There are some level of copyright exceptions. Um, and whenever you're trying to use copyright material created uh, by others, then there's always a balance between what licenses are available, whether they work for you, whether exceptions are there, and what level of risk comes with using the work when you're not necessarily sure it's covered by a license or an exception. So we go through those in our game. OK, so we're talking about copyright. Uh, the question is, what is the problem with copyright? Surely that's a system that's that's existed for many hundreds of years. 
you have rights in it as an author or as a creator. And then if someone wants to use it, they can ask your permission and they can decide whether the terms are acceptable or there's an exception that means that they can use it. And that's quite straightforward because we know what those are. Quotation has existed for many years. Well, one of the issues now is there is clearly a tension with the use of digital technology. I think, as we all know, um, it's a very different world that we have now to when copyright was first um, created. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I tell you what, I'll take over the click. Uh, so the copyright wars typically seen as between the dinosaurs of publishing and traditional media and the, the, the robots, the tech giants, the Googles, the Microsoft, the um, social media firms that are making use of copyright protected material and uh, are, are not following exactly the, the models of copyright um, uh, legislation that were previously laid out or that not necessarily that they're not following it, but they are challenging that whole idea about exclusive rights and things always coming back to the uh, author uh, or having the author being the person that decides um, giving the permission for their work. And part of the challenge of that is this, a lot of this in copyright comes from the concept of the romantic author. Copyright dates back to the Enlightenment period at a time when there were deep philosophical discussions about the implications of information being set down into a form that could be reproduced and had enormous amounts of power associated with it. And why I've got Hegel here and Kant, there was a real split at that time between a tradition from continental Europe that said the creative expression, something that someone creates, is really a part of them, it's part of their personality and their human right. As opposed to a tradition that developed more in in, in, in Britain and then carried across to eventually the United States that said the purpose of copyright is to increase creative outputs. We want more creative works and therefore there's more of a common good. It's less about the individual author getting uh, something back for them. It, the, the, the thing that is most important is that everybody, the public benefits from a law that uh, allows some protections, but also some some balance there between exclusive rights. Now, what we see now is a world of digital collaboration where it's rare, certainly in the sciences, to have a single author. We no longer have gentlemen scientists who are doing experiments and finding insights on their own and publishing. We have huge collaborative efforts and the benefits in trying to face those you know, biggest challenges we have in climate change um, and inequality throughout the world uh, and the amount of information and data uh, to have those restrictions that are based on rewards coming back to individual authors don't really make sense. And similarly, in, our, in social media and our social worlds, um, we share the systems are set up for all sorts of things to be combined together yeah. um, and, and, and some of those those laws do get uh, it, the, the previous frameworks make things very complicated. Mm. Um, so one final point on this around the issue with copyright is because we have uh, large monopolies, powerful organisations controlling the copyright, uh, the value that comes from these services, often we don't fully understand this concept of the public domain. So this diagram is from Ronan Deasley's book, Professor Ronan Deasley, who wrote Rethinking Copyright in 2006. Um, and he's pointing out that actually there are many things uh, that make up our intellectual commons. All this uh, valuable material insights that we've created. And actually only some of these are protected by copyright. There are some things which are not protected by copyright at all because either they are so old the copyright has expired or they are things that are not you could never protect by copyright such as an idea for uh, a particular type of story say a, a genre or a format um, and then there are uh, things where there's crossover in those in those areas but that often people think about the public domain as being quite a small thing it's old pictures and old things from books 
and he's asking us to think more broadly about what that is. And so we think one of the main challenges about copyright literacy is people think that copyright is bigger and more pervasive than it actually is. Mm. So we need to be clearer on where the boundaries are and what kinds of things copyright does, doesn't protect and what kind of things it does allow and doesn't allow. So at that moment, we're going to turn around and we're going to ask you a question. We are. Uh, so we should have said this at the outset. We should. We? And we, we should, should also have said we're very happy at this point as well. If there are any questions um, from anyone attending online or anybody um, in the room. But the main question we want to just ask you to first of all think about is when you, you, you knew that you were coming to a session about copyright today, how does it make you feel? What do you think when you think, oh, I'm going to learn about copyright? What sorts of words might come into your head? What sorts of things might you think um, that, you know, it, it's going to be like? Is Would anybody like to, would anybody like to tell us? I'm not sure if there's anyone in the room that wants to say anything to uh, Christina or, or somebody. Is, is there a way of people putting things in the chat? There's no, I don't think there is a chat, is yeah, there? Yeah, there's, you don't. Yeah, I'm uh, sorry, I think you cannot see it, uh, but ah. there are no answers to it. Okay, oh, we okay. encourage you to uh, say okay. it. Uh, there is an answer. Jan said that he finds it confusing. Right, confusing. okay, okay. It yeah. may have been that we've slightly primed you with this picture. Um, oh, shall oh, we? Let's let, let's oh, let's oh, go back. Sorry. There we go. Sorry. I think there might be some others. Anyone else in the room like to say so they feel confused as well? Anyone feel excited? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, we we will. Uh, sorry, sorry. One more answer in the chat. Yeah. Uh, okay. Martin says, I think it's abused by corporates on social platforms. And Dalibor says, so my first association was that it's part of law and we might face legal paragraphs learning about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would so that's because she thinks it should be updated. OK, yeah. OK. Yeah, so that's 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 quite common, particularly that first response we got about confused. Yes. Quite a lot of people find copyright annoying as well. I think that's and frustrating and potentially something that might be a well, barrier. Shall we see? Yes, let's have a look. answers that we got from previous previous people we've asked this to. In fact, what we did at this conference is we asked people to write it down on a piece of paper and then turn it into a paper aeroplane and throw it to the front. So, so we were in a very so large could, lecture theatre. Imagine that you're doing that now. You're you're folding up a piece of paper and you're letting go of your emotions. <laughs> All of these, we're getting flooded with people's thoughts. But so what, what did they say to us? Well, these are the kinds of things that some librarians have told us. Someone said that the copyright made them feel warm and fuzzy. Mm. Mm, we think that was a strange person, though. That was, that was us. But this is more common, isn't it? Worried, anxious, yep. Yeah. And we have frustrated and confused and um, whether they can worried about risk yeah uh we had a, a comment from somebody once which we liked a lot didn't we that they said um it was like uh, a being a receiver and thrower of a hot potato so i don't know if you have this metaphor in Czech but in in English if something is a hot potato you you don't want to hold it because it's so hot so have you want to have you got the hot potato I have got the hot potato Where it's is down it? there so let me see if there. I can find it it's just in that basket in that basket down here yes okay so we have a baked potato here right there's the potato <laughs> you're gonna throw it. it to me there we are so I'll throw it back to you oh. there we go oh too hot yes yeah. right. okay that's enough of that <laughs> So the the idea that, you know, if you're the person that deals with copyright, you've had this hot potato yeah, thrown I think at we've you. Done that. And there's one more, isn't there? There is one more. Confused, cautious and faintly nauseous. But um, hopefully you're not feeling too much of that at the moment. But clearly it's something where there are some negative emotions associated with having to constantly uh, 
come up against this as part of um, librarians' professional activity. Absolutely. And some of the comments um, came out when we first did our copyright literacy survey yeah. of librarians in the UK. So we had about 500 librarians who responded and that led us to want to um, actually speak to them. So we, we did some follow up research. We ran some focus groups with librarians and we've got some findings um, based on our paper that we had published in 2017 um, about librarians experiences of copyright. Chris, do you want to talk us through yes. this? Yes, so we used a methodology called phenomenography. Um, and phenomenography is about understanding different categories of experience. It doesn't say there is a, a, you know, a right and a wrong way to think about copyright uh, or a correct or incorrect understanding of it. It, it helps identify how uh, people experience a particular phenomenon and then works out how you can come up with an educational intervention that can deal with some of the problems. So some research in information literacy yes. has also used this approach. Exactly, so that's what Christine, influenced us. Christine Bruce and mm. Anne-Marie Lloyd use this in their research on information literacy, for example. Um, so the uh, here are, here's what we produced as part of it is an outcome space. So it's a diagram that shows these categories in a visual way that explains their relationship. So the first category is that copyright is experienced quite often simply as a problem, something that is problematic and stops good stuff from happening. Mm. And we put that, as you can see at the bottom, that sort of underpins everything, everything else. The second category is that it's complicated and shifting. So it's difficult to understand and even when you've got your head round it, you think you've understood it, you find that some elements of it are changing mm. because there's new, uh, new laws, laws, European uh, directives, and new new law cases that come and change the interpretation of the law. And there's new uh, licenses and policies that, that mean that you have to think about it differently. So it shifts, uh, which means people tend to want to avoid it often if they unless they absolutely have to mm. now the third category is about realizing that it can be a known entity it is something uh, that can be reduced to a set of coherent messages things that do make sense we can put it into our processes and our procedures and our guidelines to give people an idea um, so that's a way of feeling more in control of it but what we also see is that there's this or found from talking to our interviewees is that it's an opportunity for negotiation, collaboration and co-construction of understanding. So what we're talking about here is things that aren't clear. Often people say, oh, it's unclear. I don't know the answer. It's not clear from looking at the law. It's not clear from looking at a particular policy or set of guidelines. And we say, well, here is where, a for example, a librarian could be talking to a group of researchers to work out whether it is acceptable to share the underlying data that has copyright things within it or sharing uh, collections with users of a library service where we are not 100 percent sure who the copyright holder is or that the copyright is clear but these cases we can work through the detail and sometimes it involves often involves taking a risk Mm. But what we think is there's a gap between those other experiences. And Particularly that one, where it's about rules. Yes. Yeah, so and it, whether things are black and white mm, and clear yeah. cut. Yeah. And the thing with copyright, I think, is that it often isn't, is it? No. So what we often say to people is really understanding copyright, really working with it in the most effective way means becoming comfortable with uncertainty. Mm. And that's where we're trying to bridge that gap between the certainty of being a sort of category three coherent messaging space and the other one which is we find it quite exciting but I think without sufficient support clearly it's very difficult and challenging and can be very worried worrying if people think well they might make a decision and then there might be a legal a legal consequence yeah. yeah yeah so that's based on some of our research and we mentioned um the idea that our research was drawing on um, a methodology used sometimes in information literacy research. I think one of the things that 
we um, talk about in, in the IFLA chapter um, is how copyright is expressed um, in other frameworks, in other literacy frameworks. And we look specifically um, in the chapter at um, information literacy frameworks. We looked at some digital literacy frameworks and we also looked at media literacy frameworks. Um, and really what we see is that, um, you know, this, this idea of treat, understanding copyright in this broader category of literacies is really quite helpful. You can't often um, use information and media without wanting to know whether you can or can't share that information and how you can um, actually use it and turn it into something new. So kind of copyright in many ways underpins or it overlaps with many of these other literacies. Now, one of the areas that we think is really important to start thinking about is thinking about copyright in a, a, a way that is a more critical way. So critical literacies are where we start to think about power structures. We start to think about um, who, you know, who controls, whether it's information or knowledge or media and why they do that. And actually, when it comes to copyright, what you have to remember is that the laws were created by people. They are shaped by organisations. And there is an element of, of copyright, you know, that is, um, as, as Chris has said, very contested. And it doesn't always have to stay like that as technology and as society changes, then what we would hope we see is that copyright changes and reflects that as well. So we think applying some of this kind of critical mindset when we think about um, copyright as a librarian can actually be very helpful rather than seeing our role as being a kind of gatekeeper and somebody who's just there to tell people you know, well, I've got to explain to you, this is what the law says. It's more about helping people understand um, why the law might say what it does, um, but also the importance of um, the, the the copyright exceptions that exist, that are, are the legal uses of material without permission. And when, you know, when you might be able to extend that definition when there might be a public good if you're thinking about um, your collections and making those widely available and digitizing them so we we think this this kind of literacy approach is really really helpful um, I have done a lot of work and I chair the UK's information literacy group um, and I think this idea of trying to empower people I I I really um, sort of have always um, supported and, and liked the view that information literacy um, is something that's that's helping to empower people um, to use information to achieve whatever it is they want, whether it's personal, social, occupational or educational goals. And the idea um, that that actually being information literate and knowing, um, you know, uh, being able to find and use and effectively, um, you know, uh, create new knowledge is 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 a human right as well. So the the Alexandra Proclamation, I think, is very relevant here um, when we're thinking about, you know, the role that copyright also plays here. So, you know, sometimes we see these things potentially in tension that copyright's telling people it's locking information down and saying they can't do things. Whereas on the face of it, many of us as librarians want to help people find the information they need and, and be able to use that in their life. Um, what we have done as well, and we, we talk about this um, a bit more in um, in an earlier chapter that we we had published, but then we we've described it in the IFLA chapter as well. Is is put out a model and a way of teaching about copyright that we've called our critical copyright literacy framework. Um, that rather than just sort of explaining to people how the law works, you actually start a bit with the history and the philosophy of copyright and what the different schools of thought around the world um, say about why copyright laws were created. Um, that then we start to think about this idea of, of balance in the law. So this is where you would think about, um, you know, copyright exceptions and, and you know, how, how, how much scope copyright law has to to protect works. 
Obviously, licensing is very, very important. Increasingly, um, in a digital world, licenses are dictating what a lot of people can and can't do with con content. So how that relates to copyright is very important. But also um, many of the things, as I said, many activities that people want to do with information, with digital objects, with all sorts of things involves um, copyright because they don't just want to keep them for themselves. They want to share them with other people. They want to communicate about them. Um, and so that that is a really important part, we think, of this a critical approach to copyright literacy. And then obviously, finally, and somebody mentioned this, you know, well, what are the legal implications? So understanding the consequences, you know, what 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 are the consequences of, of you know, copyright infringement, as we might call it? What are the risks? Um, and when are those risks actually quite small? And when are those risks, you know, increased and, and thinking about it in that way? So we um, we wrote about this in in um, a, a chapter, um, as I say, uh, and we also one of the things had said earlier in our work is that this critical approach to copyright does actually mean that you acknowledge that there are contradictions and there are tensions. I think sometimes when you've got to teach people about copyright, that's why it feels quite uncomfortable because sometimes you tell them things and you think that doesn't quite make sense or that doesn't quite fit with the sort of behaviours that, that we see. Um, so it is about raising awareness of the flaws in copyright law and potentially being a champion um, for copyright reform and for social justice. So librarians often and when they um, attend things like the World Intellectual Property Organisation, um, IFLA and other library organisations often go very much with that, that idea that they're looking to push the boundaries of copyright and to reform and to, to you know, to, to, to basically stop copyright becoming um, a barrier to, to much of our work. OK. So what we're going to finish up with is some examples of where we've put this into practice. Um, so I, I now work at the University of Oxford, but up until April of this year, I was working at the University of Kent uh, and I was there for nearly 10 years. And, and towards the end of that time, I actually developed a copyright literacy strategy, which covered the whole of the organisation. Um, I made a case that it would be useful for and helpful for everyone who worked and studied at the university um, to have support from the whole institution. So if we look at what our vision was, it's that by 2025, people working and studying at the University of Kent will feel confident in making informed decisions about using copyright material and will understand the role copyright plays in innovation and creation of new knowledge, and that the university's approach to copyright education uh, will support its strategic objectives by informing policy and practice. Uh, so it was saying copyright is important, it's not simply something that there is a clear set of rules about that everyone needs to understand. But it, within that vision here, you can see there's a balance between using copyright material and creating new uh, works and what that means for um, enterprise working with businesses, our relationship with publishers and all of these things that are very contested um, and sometimes uh, uh, have their attentions within within the university world. So what I wanted to focus on uh, other than the vision was just a couple of the values that we came up with. Firstly, that staff and students are expected to behave lawfully and responsibly, but should be able to question assumptions about copyright law. Um, and the other one that a balance is required between the concept of copyright as private property and the importance of communication and dissemination of knowledge. So here are some here are some things again where it's often open to discussion. It's it, there's the grey areas, the the lack of clarity around copyright, but it's uh, the first one here about questioning assumptions. That's really where we were saying there is space for thinking critically about a situation. If we are being put in a position where our students were not able to do something, we weren't able to provide 
the, the proper educational experience because of something related to copyright. Well, we should question assumptions. There's no way we can do this activity because copyright says we can't. We use this. We use this during the pandemic when we were locked down and we had all those questions around, is it OK to make this material available? For example, content on DVDs, films not available to the library, but we had them in DVDs. What should we do? So we made a decision um, about whether we would digitize those and were able to question previous assumptions. And then generally, the second point is about do we embrace more open forms of sharing information? Um, yes, there is private property. We can uh, exercise our exclusive rights if we own them in copyright. But there is the importance of disseminating knowledge more widely, and that needs to come into those discussions. So what have you been doing at City? Yes. Yes, well, we can. We, we, I'll just say a little bit about um, one of the modules that I run. So this um, module um, started in uh, 2018. Um, so I'll be running this module in October, um, just in a couple of weeks time for the fourth time. Um, it was a, a new module I created when I went to work at City University. And um, it is um, part, as I say, of the, the Masters in Academic Practice that I'm um, teaching on, but it is also available to our information um, science students at City University. And we have quite a number of um, members of staff, um, including some of our library staff who've been taking this module, but also library staff play quite an important role in contributing to this module. So the module um, hasn't got copyright in the title at all, um, but actually um, understanding copyright is a really important part of um, the curriculum that we teach. And it is um, it's it's important because we see it as as one of the kind of areas of digital literacy where staff you know need to understand copyright so that they can use technology effectively for their own teaching and for their own research but also because the other part of the module is looking at what we call open practices so we look at uh, open education, we look at uh, Creative Commons licenses, we look also at uh, open access um, and um, more broader sort of ways of sharing information openly. Um, and, and so, you know, you can't do that without understanding um, how copyright works and what it does and doesn't allow you to do. There is a course um, blog as well as the course being available in our virtual learning environment for students who are taking it, but there is a course blog and there's quite a lot of information um, about the module if you're interested in finding out more. Um, I've just put a little bit more on the next slide um, to show you a bit about how it works. So it's um, uh, a, a 15 credit, which I think in European terms is 30 credits as, as a module, um, but it, it is taught over um, days. So rather than running over a term, we have teaching days because it's meant for staff so they can come on uh, a, a sort of day release um, and they get a full day of teaching in, on each of those four different days. Um, one of the um, the kind of most important days is obviously to start off talking about all the different definitions of what the terms mean. Um, and then we have a day where we focus much more on digital literacies, uh, why those matter, what that means for staff, what that means for students. And we think of this idea of being a digital scholar as well. Um, and and how we can operate, you know, with, and, and, and do many of the things that that academic staff and scholars do, researchers do using digital tools. Um, day three is really about I've called it open practices, but it looks at open education, how to create open educational resources, how to find them, but also then all about um, open access and uh, how to share their research openly and how to find other people's research. And then our final day um, is really looking at um, how to embed these practices. Um, whether it's digital literacy or aspects of openness 
into their into their own teaching, into their own ongoing um, uh, cont- professional development as well. And we um, have always had very important um, guest speakers who come in to contribute to this program. Chris always uh, has contributed and, and given a lecture about copyright and the role that that plays in open and practice and in digital uh, literacy. But we've also had several people from the open education world, Catherine Cronin and Lorna Campbell have spoken. We had a colleague from the University of Edinburgh, Jenny, who talked about blogging um, as an academic practice and why academics would do this. And then Catherine and Joe. Um, are actually the editors of one of the core readings, which is a book called Digital Literacies Unpacked. They both work at the UK's Open University. So they talk a lot about um, the the way that the Open University at the UK embeds uh, digital literacy into the curriculum. So it's it's a um, it, it's been a really interesting experience to teach this course. It does have two assessments. And I have just made a few little changes to the assessment, one of which will be that going up on the course blog will be the student's final assignment. So um, I'm hoping that there'll be much more content added to that um, with staff talking about what these things actually mean to them and being able to share those openly um, on our course blog will be really exciting. Just to say, at the very end of the day, um, uh, on the last day, we will be um, all getting together in person. I've been doing a lot of this teaching online um, because of the pandemic, but also the module works quite well as an online course. Um, but on day four, we are getting people all together and they're going to play our game, The Publishing Trap. So they they used to do this before the pan- pandemic. Um, and uh, this is just some some photos of people playing. Our are you, are publishing you taking trip. cakes? Are you uh, taking cakes this time? I am going to take cakes. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. So we're going to we're going to be playing and it will be our the third the third version of our, our game, won't it? Which we had just about ready to go with a new board just before um, the pandemic. Mm. So that's uh, that that's the the sort of examples of teaching copyright in a more engaging way that both Chris and I um, have developed. We took sort of different approaches in our different institutions. Yeah. You've got some interesting um, challenges and things that are going to come up and uh, how you're going to roll this out at the University of Oxford because you've yeah. just been there a few months, haven't you? But Absolutely. you've got lots of ideas, I think. Yeah, lots of ideas. And a lot of that is based on the work that Jane and I do broadly across the whole of the sector. Um, so one thing that we've um, uh, we, we'd mentioned in our, in our final few slides here, that we uh, are now co-chairs of a special interest group, which is the Copyright and Online Learning Special Interest Group of, for the Association for Learning Technology. So this is the organisation uh, based in the UK that supports teaching with technology always comes with copyright questions. That was the subject of the book Copyright and E-Learning that Jane wrote back in. When did you write the first? 2010. 2010. And then so we worked together on the updated version of that. I can see it on the shelf over there. Um, (laughs) uh, But then when the pandemic happened and we were then in an emergency lockdown situation, as you were too, as everybody was having to deal with these, is it okay if I do this? How do we pivot? How do we change what we do so that we don't um, uh, try let our students uh, try not to knock it? There we go. So gracefully done. Here we go. Oh, it's not, so, it's not coming out very clearly. Not very clearly. It's on the reading. It's on it's, the further it's, it's reading. It's on the yeah. further reading. Yeah. And yeah. So we've now got a, a special interest group. And what that actually means in um, practice is we started by writing a blog post and then we ended up running uh, some webinars and now it's turned into a regular thing where, as you can see from this picture, we get together in this room. uh, We often wear matching T-shirts because we've got lots of copyright related T-shirts and merchandise as well. But we bring together our community. We have excellent guest presentations. So a few of the examples of people we have, Bridget, the director of policy at Creative Commons, Kyle Courtney, the copyright advisor at Harvard, Emily Hudson, who is a a colleague of ours, a a copyright expert at King's College London, which is where I did my master's. And also another really great presentation we had from Karis Craig and uh, Bob Tarantino coming to us from Canada, 
who wrote uh, a paper all about the challenges and the problems the copyright caused in people sharing culturally during a time when they were forced to use online uh, platforms and the online platforms have a habit, habit of taking down copyright material. We were joined by people from a range of organisations and it's just become some part of, of what we do now. Um, so here we try to keep all that spirit of trying to think uh, creatively about how to address copyright challenges and, and discuss these things um, and come together and give each other support and something that can sometimes make people feel quite, as we said, negative emotions. Mm. And those of us who do deal with copyright can sometimes feel quite isolated mm. because it's not often a topic that people want to talk to them about at, at length. I was just going to go back because if you go to the the, the link afterwards, mm. um, what you'll be able to see. So all our webinars are open webinars that are free to attend um, and you'll be able to see the upcoming schedule. You'll also be able to go and have a look um, at previous recordings. If there's any topics that you're interested in, if you wanted to see the presentation from uh, Bridget at Creative Commons, for example, we have these all on a YouTube channel as well so that you can um, you can tune in and you can uh, catch up afterwards. We've got some exciting webinars coming up in November and December. So we have um, invited the editors of the IFLA book, the Navigating uh, Copyright for Libraries, to join us at um, a webinar in November and December. So we will have um, various other people, hopefully, who've written different chapters yeah. coming and talking um, about their copyright challenges and the, the what they wrote about in their book in a bit more detail. And if you're interested in keeping up to date, hearing about new webinars and developments with the group, you're all welcome to join the special interest group. Yes, um, it is open to anyone. So it's you're, if you join. follow the link on, on this page here, it's free for anyone to join, subscribe to a, a, a mail list, where it's minimal traffic, it's just updates on what the group is doing and the activities um, and the webinars that we're putting on. Yep. And we do have a Twitter account for that group, don't we, we do. as well? Yeah. Yep. And so. on the 16th of December, we're having a Christmas special. <laughs> so if you fancy getting copyright and Christmas together, playing, <laughs> taking part in a quiz, having some fun, you're very welcome to join us. So that's that's the sorts of things you can do if you're interested um, in keeping in touch with us. Um, so um, but what we thought we would do is um, we've got some time to take questions from the floor, um, but we've also got some questions that we would like to ask um, you in the room as well. Um, and uh, we've we can we can kind of take a little break if you want to have a think about any of these answers to the questions. We know um, that some of you who are joining remotely, you can perhaps put anything in the um, the chat. If we maybe start at the first question um, about what aspects of um, your library work that you're doing or that you think you'll do in the future might involve copyright issues. I think that's quite an interesting question um, to open up. Has anybody had any experiences to date where they've been asked questions about copyright, where they've been working in a library? Are there any areas that they think, you know, are going to in the future lead to them needing to learn a bit about copyright? So what about that first question? Is there anyone who would like to um, comment on that or put something in the chat? Anyone in the room feeling brave? <laughs> The room seems to be silent. <laughs> We're happy to take any questions yeah. or anything or receive any comments here. We just thought these might be a useful way of starting that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. So we can open it up for any other questions as well. Based on what we've said today, is there anything? Yeah, I think we can probably uh, move on because it doesn't seem that um, 
Anyone has any ideas along the way? Okay. Uh, okay, there is one. There is one. There is one. Okay. <laughs> well, it, it's actually more question for you than an answer. <laughs> well, I'm going to read it anyway. Uh, what is your opinion on copyright claims on YouTube? Oh, copyright claims on YouTube. Yes. Well, we did have a we did have one of our webinars taken down off YouTube, didn't we? We did. Yes. Yeah, it got an automatic takedown because we played uh, a small amount of music in it, and it got taken off um, off YouTube straight away, pretty much, didn't it? So yeah, yeah. So I think the answer to that, I would go back to. Um, uh, Karis Craig and Bob Tarantino uh, and if you actually look back in our webinar list so if you look at our YouTube uh, playlist so you'll see all of our YouTube things as Jane said one of them did get taken down but this this one didn't um, I think that that's a really good discussion um, and it won't just be us talking it's, it's them giving a great presentation here so what happens um, with and I'll, I'll go back to here because I will uh, mm. reference uh, Karis and Bob uh, the copyright system works in a certain way that uh, there is um, an opportunity for copyright holders to challenge someone else's use of their work. And there is the system of the courts that uh, allows them to take legal action um, or write letters threatening with legal action. But ideally, what you want is to have contractual arrangements where you avoid legal tension because everyone is in agreement. But the way that the YouTube works is it has this notice and takedown or uh, mechanism. There is uh, a automatic um, process that's triggered where music or other content matches something that's on the database. So it's called content ID. And it doesn't actually follow the rules of copyright law. No. It follows the policy that YouTube have created, which does call on you know, the United States copyright law, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, that has something called safe harbor. And that means that YouTube is not responsible for infringement if they didn't know that the, they didn't put the material there themselves. So basically the users are responsible for infringement mm. and therefore material gets taken down according to that automatic process in order to uh, avoid uh, YouTube, Google being liable for the content. But often that system gets it wrong because, of course, it's using technology, automated matching. It's not actually looking at whether there are parodies or pastiches or fair uses of copyright. Uh, works. Mm. So it's a very blunt tool. Now, the next part of the story is what's happening across the European Union, where the most recent legal development is a, is a directive called the D Digital Single Market Directive um, that has a provision in it, article, which one is it? 13? The, 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 they, they kept changing the they, numbers. They changed the numbers. Yes. What it says is that YouTube and any other online uh, service uh, platform like that has to ensure that the infringing content doesn't go on the site in the first place. Mm. So it won't be the case where something goes up and then it gets triggered and a copyright holder will then come in, decide whether to monetize or, or pull it down. It will actually be not possible to upload that content mm. unless there is a license agreement. So we've yet to see exactly how that plays out because it's only just coming into mm. the laws of the EU member states. And we haven't yet seen, I don't think we've seen a change in the way that YouTube or other sites operate, but potentially it's going to become harder mm. for people to share content um, that involves other people's copyright material on video on you know, and sharing platforms so it's and you know, people are very critical of that if yeah. the people that use youtube and upload content so it's you know it's not something that's going to have a satisfactory uh, resolution anytime soon it's it's also i think one of the the biggest complaints that people have about it is um it doesn't take account of copyright exceptions 
um, or, you know, as they have in the, the US and the several other countries, this concept of fair use. So um, quite a few years ago, I, I took the, the online course that Harvard offer that's called Copyright X, which is a, a fantastic um, free course that you can you can um, you have to apply to, to to take part in it. But it's an excellent course. Um, but it is it's taught by a professor. Um, Terry Fisher at Harvard, who um, wants to kind of push the boundaries. All the videos that uh, for the lectures are up on YouTube. And one of the things he wanted to do was to talk about case law and a lot of case law um, related to fair use in America is actually about music. And so, um, you know, there are times where he might want to, on the lecture, play excerpts from the music. And what he explained to us was that he had to go through quite a lengthy process of um, putting up his videos with the music in, having them taken down, and then having to negotiate and write to YouTube and explain why this was fair use and that he's a professor of copyright law and obviously he understands fair use so he could do this quite successfully um, and he managed to get um, he managed to get that that content um, so it is available um, but many people aren't in that position where they can do that and you know while you can see that YouTube are trying to stop copyright infringement um, and people you know putting up, you know, sort of illegal or pirated versions of things. One of the problems is, as Chris says, it's a very blunt instrument. And we had an experience with one of your former colleagues at the University of Kent, who's a, a history uh, lecturer, but he is also, he, he took to being a musician with his family during the lockdown. They made lots of videos, which were parodies of songs. And um, they ran into problems as well where and we have we actually have a, a podcast where we interview him. He's, he's called Dr. Ben Marsh and he talks, you know, he really he just hadn't realised that he was going to get so involved in copyright just through making what he thought was sort of fun parody versions of songs and sharing those on the Internet. And obviously, you know, copyright does now affect more and more people who who may want to do things where you know they have a legitimate reason for wanting to do that whether they're teaching or whether they're they're doing it for another reason so really good question um and yeah i think you know it's it's definitely something we need to we need to watch because increasingly copyright will be regulated by platforms who may end up behaving very cautiously and, and stopping a lot of content that, that you know, is, is actually very creative. So in that time, did that lead, did anyone else ask any questions? Let's just go back to our questions that we had. Yes, but I think that we can probably go back where we were and answer the questions later when you finish. Your OK, part. yeah, that's fine. We can do that. Yeah, yeah, we are. We are almost at the end, I think. So we've got, uh, I think. I think that is that I is think, effectively yeah, the end of the, 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 the inside. We can show them the absolutely. Yeah. So what we've got here, this is just um, our details. Um, I've put our Twitter account and our website on there. Um, we are um in touch with christina so if you do want our emails if you've got questions afterwards um then we can actually send through some slides and we'll just put our new our email addresses on mm -hmm. as well won't we um but one of the things you know we would sort of suggest do have a look we've got all the references of things that we've been talking about today um we need to put the full reference for the ifla book because we haven't quite finished that i notice yeah um but um that is really i think that that's that's what we wanted to talk to you about today we wanted to make sure there was plenty of time to answer any questions if you want us to follow up and tell you a bit more um about how our games work we know we've got a little bit of time so i'm going to stop sharing the screen and uh we look forward to answering some more questions but also as i say if you would like us to show you anything else that we've talked about in a bit more detail then um please yeah just let us know 
So what other questions do we have um, in the chat? OK, uh, the first one is, if, uh, has, has Brexit affected copyright in any way? That's a good question. <laughs> uh, Chris, do you want to take that? I was going to say. Yes, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to take that. Yeah. So we, we've, we're now in a situation where in the UK, our law is still to a very large part based on recent judgments that come from the Court of Justice of the European Union. So the definition of what it, what communication to the public means. So th this is that that restricted act that relates to sharing things online. Those definitions come from uh, recent European court judgments. And uh, similarly, the question about what actually makes uh, what is an original copyright work. However, we now are separate from Europe, so we uh, are able to make this. Our courts are able to make decisions. Our government is able to make uh, new laws that don't refer to those um, European Union directives. So the most recent development is I mentioned the digital single market directive that doesn't apply in the UK. Mm. So we don't have to change our laws in line with that. So in the UK, we don't have to apply that content filtering law. We don't have to apply uh, another law uh, around um, not being able to claim copyright in in scanned digitized versions of out of copyright mm. artistic works. So that is coming across Europe, across the EU, but not in the UK. But what we recently announced is something, uh, changes coming to UK law on text and data mining. So something that's very important to the library profession is how we help researchers to look at very large data sets, many of which are protected by copyright or database rights, and that has been the plan is to expand that to allow even commercial use, because at the moment we have a copyright exception in the UK that says we can make non-commercial use, copying large corpuses of data and information in order to run uh, computational analysis, to run algorithms uh, uh, to find out whether there are patterns in that data. So there is going to be a change across the European Union, but it's going to now diverge from where we are in the UK. And our government was very uh, made a, a big point about how we were able to make these changes because we were no longer part of the European Union, which is, of course, they were going to say that yeah. because they were, you know, that's that's where they are politically. For yeah. us, I think we 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 find it challenging. Yeah because yes. we work so closely with European colleagues and really there is a huge benefit in us having more aligned laws, having aligned laws and it just yeah. creates all sorts of problems if things work differently and that's one of the big problems in copyright law that actually the laws in different countries are different and mm. it makes it hard to share things absolutely and it makes it hard for when you um, run um, courses and teach um, you know students across across the world as well, what you can and can't do in different countries obviously varies a little bit. Um, one of the things that's probably just worth saying was that our um, copyright laws in the UK were actually updated quite substantially in 2014. Um, so we've, I think with all the many changes that have been going on in, in UK government um, and obviously with Brexit, one of the things that we've seen is that changing our copyright laws soon is not going to be a priority because I think there was such a big piece of work done um, and while 2014 is actually now eight years ago it is it's still in you know in in, in terms of copyright our laws are kind of generally changed about every 30 years it seems or so so we 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 last had substantial changes to the copyright act in 1988 um and so the 2014 changes were meant to bring in lots of things to make copyright fit for the digital age um 
And um, some of the things that came in in the UK in 2014 were actually quite ahead of their time. So text and data mining mm. was something we've had in our law since since then, isn't it? Mm. And also we've got um, a widened exception for um, uh, teaching. So if you are teaching, we have an exception in UK law that we've had, which was broadened in 2014, which proved actually to be quite helpful to rely on during the pandemic yeah. so i i don't think at the moment we will see many changes but obviously potentially we 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 can now diverge but there is one thing that, that was a big change which was around orphan works mm. so we had uh we were able to take advantage of european regulations where if libraries or cultural institutions or educational ex institutions uh, were trying to digitise and make available works in their collection where they didn't know who the copyright holder was or they weren't able to secure the copyright uh, permissions from them. Uh, those are termed as orphan works. And there was a, a scheme where we could do some searching and then register these works with the European Intellectual mm. Property Office. Um, and at the moment of Brexit, that no longer was available to us. So um, when I was at Kent, we made a few works available on that basis and we were we were protected or we had a, a defence against an accusation of copyright infringement. And then that fell away. So that was a real shame. Mm. That we, yeah, it was it was a it was a problem. We're now back to where we were before, which is having to rely on risk management and mm. taking that risk on ourselves. So good question though, very good yes. question. Great answer, thank you. Uh, there are actually two questions related to uh, future of copyright in the age of artificial intelligence. Oh. More specific if you think that AI and machine learning algorithms, algorithms <laughs> deserve mm -hmm. copyright on their own. What do you think about that? Well, that that was actually also part of the government consultation that was done at the start of the year, wasn't it? It was about artificial intelligence and, and copyright and whether works created through artificial intelligence, you know, should should they qualify for copyright protection and who should own who should own them as well, whether it's the, the person that writes the algorithm or the company that creates the AI, um, it's it's um, it's certainly an area of a huge interest. Some of it might be quite philosophical as well. Of it gets quite hard to 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 think these things through because the example, what we're looking at now and what's happening is changing everything so quickly. And where we're going to be in five years' time is going to be very different. Mm. The UK government decided not to change the law around who owns copyright in a computer generated work. Yeah. They agreed that the the um, it's already the work, in our law. It's isn't already it? in there, although it is defined in a way that may not actually cover a lot of these artificial intelligence examples. But it's basically the person or the organization that creates the software that then owns the copyright in the subsequent work that's created. But what we see now is a very confusing space with all of these tools and anyone mm. can set something off and it's sucking in all of this content from that already exists and then spitting stuff out mm. that, that that makes us think, well, what does, what does this actually mean? I think most, there have been some really good uh, discussions about this. Um, and I'm thinking of one in particular was the Charles Clark lecture, um, uh, in the UK, I think the recording's still available. We can find it where we have experts, legal experts, and uh, leading thinkers thinking about the philosophical side of it. Mm. But if we go back to that idea about the romantic author, the purpose of copyright laws was to incentivize individual human beings to create things because mm. then they would get a financial reward, they'd get remuneration for their work, it would keep them creating. Mm. Now, you clearly don't need to incentivize a machine in that way, but there are financial things going on in the background. These, these machines that we can use are funded by enormously rich and powerful technology companies mm. that are, are 
they get so much value from, from creating these technologies that copyright in and of itself, in the way it's formulated, is not really the right tool to regulate that kind yeah. of activity, to make sure that that we as human beings are getting the benefit of artificial intelligence sort of coming into our realm and starting to take over this whole area of, of creativity. I think we need a really bold rethink because what we tend, I see these conversations, yeah. we're fixated on these ideas about copyright because we think, well, that's just the way it has to be. That was an invention of the Enlightenment time that responded to the printing press. Yeah. So we are going through something similar. We do need regulatory things in order to try to encourage ethical and uh, prohibit unethical uses of artificial intelligence. But it, is it, it copyright? It, it, it copyright comes into that, but it's only one element of a whole range of things. And it's a great to topic, actually, to, um, you know, if if you're looking of ways when you've got to teach other people about copyright, absolutely. Like, you know, thinking about copyright and artificial intelligence. Um, quite a lot of us um, in the UK often have used this, the, the, the case from a couple of years ago that's called the monkey selfie case, um, which was all about um, the monkey that, 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 that took a selfie. And then, you know, the question around whether um, a non-human, so an animal, it, whether, you know, can they be creative and, and should the work be protected or should it have been the person who owned the camera or who gave the camera to the monkey? So these are some, you know, if you're looking, you're looking in the right places and asking the right questions, I think, if you if you use these as reasons for kind of saying for people when they will say, oh, copyright, why does that matter? It's not interesting and it's not relevant. It's hugely relevant. And I think, yeah, as Chris says, what we, we don't want is to just continue with a law that was largely created, you know, for 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 regulating um, certainly pre-digital works and, and, and saying, oh, well, we're going to ca carry on using. We need to somehow extend that and make that regulate that because it's the wrong tool for it. Copyright still, I think, has a place. Uh, but we need other things to ensure. But, but copyright has become the mechanism by which lots of large corporations manage their assets, yes. essentially, and protect yes. their work and, you know, sort of use it as a way to to stop people, you know, putting putting up, you know, films, music, all that sort of, um, you know, high value content and making it freely available on the Internet. So it's it, it is I think when we went back to our slide with that the copyright war that's why we would say that teaching around copyright is such an important area as well because I think these battles are going to continue certainly for at least you know the next 10 20 years and they they I don't think there's any sign that somebody's just going to say let's let's just get rid of copyright because there's a huge industry or there's a whole set of industries that are very vested in strengthening copyright laws and making more and more things more difficult for people to do things you know that that we used to do with our analog content we you know we need to think about just as librarians this idea of loaning books and buying books and having those on shelves and some of the we haven't really talked about this but some of the challenges of e-lending, you know, because much of it is being regulated now by publishers who want to sell us licenses and want to stop libraries doing kind of what they've always done, which is putting things on shelves and loaning them out to people. And they can do that when when it's all electronic in the same way, you know, that that you know what you do with your digital music can be much more closely regulated than when you had it there on the shelf. So yeah more questions <laughs> <laughs> big questions those ones yeah okay uh since there are no questions in the okay. room yet um anyway i would like to ask you uh obviously there are many let's say gray areas in the topic of copyright so i would like to ask what does it mean for 
librarians or educators like yourself who are teaching other people about copyright? How, how do you teach about these things if there's so much that is uncertain? I think one of the really important parts of that is to clarify uh, whose responsibility it is to make a decision. And I think what librarians often find is because they have awareness of this knowledge of copyright law, not necessarily a deep legal understanding, but certainly it's always there as part of the profession. You understand that rights holders have certain rights and that there are certain activities that library users uh, will want to do which open up these questions. So people will often come to a librarian and say, is it OK? Can I do this? Yes or no? And because the answer is maybe, maybe not, um, sometimes that can be a difficult conversation to have. Mm. So what I've spent quite a lot of time doing in my profession, uh, in my professional life, is setting up that conversation so it's clear that the person asking ultimately has to make that decision. We can provide them with the information in order to balance a risk of being challenged for infringement versus the risk of not being able to provide content to students or being able to share their research, but that it's not ultimately up to the librarian to decide. They're not a gatekeeper. No. They are there to support and provide help. So I think that's uh, a really important way of navigating that grey area. It goes back to what we were saying about those different categories of experience and negotiation, co-creation, collaboration. Um, and it's not just a, a cop out. It's not a way of saying, oh, we, we don't want to stand up. It's too hard. It's too difficult to do our jobs. And we'd rather just let somebody else to, to just decide. It's it's actually the responsible way of doing it because the response is here is you can give them an idea of how risky it is but ultimately if somebody in your library is making copies of something then it's up to them to determine what's fair for their purposes for that use as long as they're being properly informed of it clearly if somebody is in there just doing massive whole scale copying of items um, in a way that's almost certainly an infringement of copyright, then you'll have to step in and say, we can't allow you to do this because there's a certain level of responsibility we have. But if you're talking about most of the sort of marginy grey area things where it's not quite sure on one hand this, on the other hand that, which is where we find ourselves most of the time, it's about being very clear. I'm here to help you do your work but we also have these other things to think about. We have policies that say you shouldn't break the law. Mm. Um, and maybe you, the, the probably the biggest risk that we see is people are being more cautious than mm. they need to be. The risk isn't that we need to go around stopping people from doing things that are obvious infringement. It's actually saying, no, there is a justification from what you're doing. Make sure that you attribute your sources. Make sure you present it in this way. Um, make sure you follow the steps of what are what we regard as good practice. And we haven't spoken about it, but we're doing work to try to develop codes of uh, good practice and fair practice mm. around these areas that don't say what is right and is wrong. They don't say there's no grey area and we're going to disappear and make everything a, a, like a clear, bright line because it's impossible to do. But it does frame it in a different way that's about making people understand their roles, their responsibilities. And that is towards empowerment, because mm -hmm. in some, if somebody's coming to you as a librarian and saying, oh, deal with my copyright problem, tell me the answer. Mm. Well, there you're actually empowering them by giving them the information they need. They might not think they want it. They might not want to hear it because they think that you're probably going to say no. But if you actually say maybe, Mm. Here's the framework that you make your decision, then that's empowering for them and it make, helps them make decisions that are based on not just following rules, but uh, align with the ethics of what they're trying to do as well. I, I, if I can, I, I'll just follow up on that. Are you going to pick something from the book? No, well, I was one of the, <laughs> I was looking at the book, yes. Yes, I may read from my book. No, I'm not going to read from the book, no. But one of the things when I try to teach people about copyright, I think there are some things, 
you know, that are are clearer. And I, I think it is about presenting copyright information um, to them in a in a, a kind of, you know, in in language that avoids jargon, not always talking about the legislation, but kind of just explaining it. So Chris and I, when we created the card game, one Absolutely. of the things, the card game is just down there, actually. One of the things we did with the card game was we wanted to create icons. So we were very influenced by what Creative Commons had done where they created their licenses and they put CC by and Chris is just showing you some of the cards um, and they, you know, I think when you want to teach people about copyright, yes, you want to empower them. You do. You don't want to act as the, the sort of. Yeah, that, that's it. Yeah. You don't want to act as the gatekeeper. Um, but I think there are ways that you can teach it that make it easier for people to then rather than just saying oh well this is this is the question what's the answer give them a framework so that they can and, go and this that. is a framework and, yeah this th these are all the things you need to know about copyright printed on cards with simple plain english explanations and nice pretty pictures that, that people can actually sort out themselves so yeah. that, that is sort of the the essence of what we do in a, a card game session would be to sort of break down any copyright question using this framework to be saying, um, well, first of all, what are we talking about? What type of work have we got? So the, the copyright in a nutshell slide that Chris presented is, is our framework. What kind of work have we got? What do you want to do with it? Is there a possible license that you could use here? Is there a copyright exception you could rely on? And then our final set of cards, which we didn't really talk about are our risk cards. So we, you know, that's your final thing. If somebody's relying on a copyright exception, what, well, what is the risk? How, you know, and these are just numbers. They're just so numbers. The, you, yeah. you have to pick something. So again, it's, it's like, it, they are kind of slightly arbitrary. Zero is no risk. Uh, five is the highest level of risk. It's in there somewhere, isn't it? The card's missing. This <laughs> no. card. Uh, we've got rid of one level of risk. Great. Um, <laughs> But yes, there there's grey area, but we're we're trying to get people to kind of come up, make a decision. Yeah. Rather than just say, oh, it's too complicated, it's too grey. Yeah. And then we discuss it. Yeah. And and that's the other thing we do a lot in our teaching oh. is we There it is. Oh, there's number five, yes. <laughs> we, we 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 use scenarios. So you would you would take a scenario. So you've got a lecturer and they've got the book copyright and e-learning and they want to make available one chapter from this book to students. They want to put it online and you give the group that scenario. How do you think they can do it? Use the cards. What, what type of work is it? What do they want to do with it? Is there a license? Is there a copyright exception? And, and actually by Every time we teach, we if we were teaching lecturers or teachers, we would use examples of things that they want to do. If we're teaching librarians, we use real examples of things that librarians we know do. You know, they, they've got a special collection. They've got lots of photographs that maybe date from the 1950s. So they potentially are still in copyright, but they don't know who owns them and they think they were taken you know, by somebody who worked at their organisation, but they're not sure. So what could they do? And, and, and actually discussing those kinds of scenarios in a teaching session is really helpful because, you know, what we get people to see is there isn't just one answer as well. You know, there, there's there's different things and different organisations might take different approaches or you come up with more questions that you would ask. Well, you know, what are the photos of and what sort of information have you got about them and what type of organisation are you? And, you know, all sorts of things like that. So it's kind of using lots and lots of examples and, you know, making it clear to people, um, you know, that that it is it is it is not always clear cut. And that's OK. They don't have to have all the answers as the librarian. If somebody comes in and asks you, you know, how do I, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking for information on a topic. 
your job is not to provide them with all the answers, it's to point them in the right direction. So I think much of what we do when we give copyright advice is quite similar to what we do when you're at a reference desk and you're answering and helping somebody, you're helping, helping them ultimately to find their own answers. Does that answer that question? Yep, thank you. <laughs> uh, there's actually one more question from the chat, so I'll read it for you. Uh, it's a little bit personal question. Oh, what is your, <laughs> what's your idea on copyright that only a few people in your circle would agree with you on? Oh, well, each of us, so what's... What the people in our circle would agree with us Yeah, on. yeah. What's it, what, have you got any ideas about copyright that you think only a few people would agree? I mean, I think it's an interesting point about whether, whether within a small circle we have a different, a different idea that we would say publicly. I mm. think maybe that's a, that's maybe what that's getting about or certainly what it's making me think about mm. we have in the past asked questions um about whether people have done certain things have they done things that are likely to be infringements yes have they i mean have we all you know have we downloaded something off the internet that maybe we shouldn't have done or um, shared things or shared you? things i mean i think what we what we increasingly what we've tried to do is not have a a separation between what we would do in our normal lives and then what we would say publicly. So we talk about the fact that um, you know people do infringe copyright all the time. Yeah. The copyright law is set up in a way that means it's impossible not to infringe. And we like to try to push the boundaries, and we like to we create parodies, and we do things yeah. um, yeah. like that. So from that perspective, I'd say there's not really much that we would do within a smaller group that we wouldn't share publicly. No, but I think I suppose one thing as well is that the more you get to know about copyright, maybe it makes you less risk averse. Yeah, we have thought talked about category five, haven't we? Yeah, we have. <laughs> so we came up with those four categories and sometimes we wonder, well, maybe there is this category five type person. Are we in this one where, you know, we love it. We deal with it all the time and perhaps Perhaps we benefit from that confusion. I think to a certain extent we do, don't we? Benefit yeah. from the fact that it's confusing yeah. and that it's something that can't be resolved because there's a fundamental tension in here. So people come and ask us, can you come in and help us and explain all of this stuff so that it will be clear? And we come in and we say, well, it's not very clear. That's the way <laughs> it is. So are we are we benefiting from it? It, you know, is copyright just a great big mess that we just circle around forever and ever and ever? Um, I don't I don't think it is really. I mean, I think that's no. just some, something that we sometimes talk about. Sometimes. That's probably that's probably us sharing. We are we are we are also we're having a webinar about open textbooks. And one of the things that we have discussed endlessly for the last three years is this book. So this book is published by a traditional publisher. Yes. And one of the things I particularly, I would say, I'm a very strong advocate saying open textbooks, this is the way to go. We need to make them open. Um, but it's really difficult, actually. So we, you know, we were we were really fortunate with that IFLA book that they, I think, they had funding to make mm. it available as an open access book. And when we have spoken to publishers about open access books, um, it, it sort of feels a bit like something where maybe we have a principle, but then it's very hard to stick to that principle. Yes, it's true. But having said that, if you do play our game, The Publishing Trap, you will see we make that very clear. Yeah. If you are an academic and you want to get on on your career, you will get more mileage from going for a prestigious journal or a prestigious publisher for your book. So mm. it's not like we're we're pretending that it isn't. No. It's always a compromise that you have to make. Yeah. Um, but I don't think I don't think either of us are secretly saying, oh well we, we think, you know, 
it, it it's you know, piracy is a good thing or something like that. I think I don't think. Well, I mean, piracy in itself is yeah. a very loaded term. It and, is. And it I'm is. Not sure we would, you know. But I think talk about things in that term. No, yeah. no, no. But I think uh, you know. I think sometimes there is a perception, certainly quite a few years ago that sort of people friends and family would sort of say oh don't talk to Jane about copyright things you know if they if you're doing something naughty don't tell Jane as if I, I've 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 got a, a badge yeah like like our puppet he's got a badge yeah, he? Yeah. he might do he could join the webinar couldn't he he's got right. a little badge he's a he's like a sheriff there we are. so he could come in and arrest people if they're if they're um <laughs> If they're doing copyright infringement, we quite liked the fact he's got this little sheriff's badge. But no, I mean, I I think that it is just a it's kind of that is something that sometimes it feels a bit uncomfortable. And it's kind of just saying to people, well, we're not always we're not into copyright because we're trying to somehow strongly informed. Well, I became more of the good guy when I stopped working for a rights holder organisation and started working for libraries. Yeah. Um, then it was easier because that's an example where people working in the music industry, standing up for uh, the rights and copyright, um, how many of them were involved in infringing copyright, sharing music? Mm. Uh, um, that's a question. Yeah. But yes. Yeah. I, I hope that answers the question. I hope we understood it properly. There's a load of stuff. <laughs> Thank you. I think it was really clear and I wish we had more time, but unfortunately time is up. I was going to say we're running out of time now, aren't we? So, yes. Okay, so we, but, will, we, will, we will send our slides so that everybody has yeah. those available after today and we'll make sure we'll pop our email addresses on there as well. And if people would like to come to our next webinar, it's next Friday. Um, and it's at 11 o'clock in the morning, which I think will be 12 o'clock check time. Yes. Um, and the, the link and the details is on our website. You don't have to register. There are, the details are on the website that you'll get in the slides. And it will be about open textbooks. So it would be lovely to see to see people if you want to come. Thank you for your invitation. And uh, before we say goodbye, I just want to thank you a lot. Uh, to in, for introducing us to uh, actually I think it's great that you took this topic which made people confused and nauseous and just uh, <laughs> somehow uh, transform it into this great community of excited people and cakes and stuff. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, so thank you again for the lecture and um, yeah you soon i guess yeah thank, thank you, you. we will we will we will email and send our send our slides so thank you everybody and goodbye thank have a good rest of the day thank you bye thank you very much for your time bye bye thank, thank you, you. Thank